It's time now for the award-winning number one local talk show in Northeast Pennsylvania, The Sam LaSant Show. Now here's your host, Sam LaSant. Hey folks, I got an exciting show for you today. It's a, gonna be a very informative show. I highly recommend that you call your friends up and your neighbors and have them watch this show. As you know, it's seen 24 hours on ssptv.com. My guest today, Father Pio Francesco Mandato, a Franciscan priest. And folks, I'm gonna show you a picture of Father and he has two of his best friends, I guess, Pepe, Pepe, and Ezekiel. And Father uh, Mandato, uh, Father Pio Mandato was very fortunate. Uh, his first communion was given to him by Saint Padre Pio. And his family is connected with the Saint uh, Padre Pio. And today, folks, we're going to talk about a few things. Hopefully that they'll be informative. Um, I know many of you uh, watch our massive inspiration every weekend, uh, and we appreciate that. Thank you so much for the uh, kind comments that we have on the Mass. So let me welcome Father Pio. Father, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. You're a busy person. This week, at least. Yeah. Now, you're a Franciscan yes. priest, and you're in the Diocese of Scranton. Okay. Now, tell me about yourself, okay? Um, uh, and I know a little later on we have a relic, okay, the, a glove that was worn by St. Padre Pio. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that relic a little later on the show. But um, tell me about you. Well, I'm really gifted. I, uh, maybe that's the first s statement. Uh, so grateful to the Lord for my life. I love my priesthood. It's an awesome, awesome gift. And uh, I'm so grateful to be here in the diocese. I've been here almost 20 years now. Came in under Bishop Timlin who accepted me. I was a Franciscan before with uh, another community. Um, but I always had more of a desire to live a contemplative life. And um, so I came knocking on Bishop Tillman's door in 1998, I think it was. And he was so gracious, as the, many of the priests in the diocese here. And, but he accepted me in the diocese way back then. I was able to get a little property uh, in Northeast PA. And um, so I lived primarily a contemplative life. And at times I'd do a little retreat work, uh, sometimes with the parishes, sometimes at a retreat house. And this week we were at um, St. John Bosco, they were Father Rick. And that's when I met you on uh, Sunday. Um, Father, your family uh, in, was born in Italy, of course. You were born in Italy. Correct. And close to St. Padre Pio. Yes. Okay. Tell me that affiliation there. Yeah, well, that's the, another gift from the Lord. Um, we come from the same hometown that he comes from, Pietrocina, in southern Italy. It's just about an hour east of Naples. And uh, so my grandfather, uh, Pietrocina is a very small town, not that big. and. At the time, it was 3,000 people in population when the Padre was born. And um, so people were very close, tight-knit, big extended family. My grandfather was a contemporary as my grandmother of the Padre. And mom and dad knew, especially mom, since she was a little, little girl. And when we were kids, oftentimes she would take us to San Giovanni, which was about an hour and a half away uh, from Pietrocino, where he lived most of his life. But his life, his spirituality, that of the friars, uh, very much influenced my life, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, he gave you First Communion. Correct. Okay. Do you remember him? I do, absolutely. Yeah, there's a number of uh, vague memories because I was eight yeah. years old. That's yeah. when we came to the States. I'll tell you one particular uh, in encounter. My grandfather took us upstairs to the, uh, where the friars were, and only the men were allowed in the cloister. And the Padre was sitting there in a, like a circle with some of the guys. My grandfather was there. And he started passing the little box around. I was a kid. I don't know what it was. And the guys were passing. And I grabbed it, passed it along. And then later on, I found out it was snuff. He used to use snuff to clear his, uh, oh. for medicinal purposes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but on that particular instance, uh, my grandfather went up to him and inter uh, introduced me. Of course, Padre Pio knew me. But I'm not that I saw him every day. And he gave me a big, big hug, a bear hug. And he pulled me into his chest. And afterwards, I told my mom, Mom, Padre Pio smells like perfume all over his belly, his stomach. And my mom says, he doesn't wear perfume. Friars didn't wear perfume. But, but I, what actually what I had smelled was the scent of roses, mm -hmm. the, the scent of his sanctity. Mm -hmm. uh, Did he have the um, stigma? Oh, yes, he had him for 50 years. Yeah. So you saw that. Well, again, I was a kid. Only during Mass would he 
remove the gloves. Okay. And you can actually see the stigma, you can see the bleeding wounds, especially if you're up close. Although he had very long sleeves uh -huh. to kind of cover them. And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my memories of the stigma are, are very uh, fuzzy, mm -hmm. so to speak. From what I understand, people used to stand in line for a long oh. time for confession, and you had to get a ticket, actually, to uh, receive confession, correct? Because there were so many people yeah. that uh, you had to make an appointment. And he didn't want people to go more than like, like once every two weeks. I understand that he actually used sometimes to know the sins of people Absolutely. Be before he, they would. I told you with my dad. My dad went to confession. He was 17 years old. First time, and he knelt down and blessed me, Father, for I sinned, and Padre Pio stopped him. And he told my dad, uh, you do this. He told him three things. You do this, you do this. But the fourth thing, my dad revealed what it was. My dad, Padre Pio said to him, you blaspheme. You use God's name in vain. And the, and the Padre Pio added, I know that you're sorry after you do, but it's not enough. You have to also repent and be willing not to do it again. He gave him a penance for one month, 30 Our Fathers every day. He was teaching him how to pray. But then my father, as he came out of confession, he was weeping and weeping. And he said from that moment on, that, that sin was lifted from his soul. Never struggled with that sin again. So the Padre read his heart, as you're saying, yeah. as he did in many, many situations. So with that being said, and, and you look at, you know, Lourdes, you know, the Blessed Mother appearing, and, and uh, we were very, my wife and I were very fortunate to go there. And it's a, it's a feeling that you, you just, you know, can't understand until you're there. But... With that being said, you know, uh, we talked about faith and mm -hmm. we talk about, mm -hmm. you know, as a Catholic, okay, um, here you have living proof, St. Padre oh, Pio, yeah. okay, uh, of what, you know, it's living proof, okay. We have the Mass, Catholics have the Mass. Um, tell me why, explain to me as a Catholic, why the Mass is so important and explain yeah, it to me. That's a good point, that's a real good point. Yeah, that's... Um well, the Mass is a reliving of the life of Christ and particularly his sacrificial moments and the last moments of his life, which we call the, the passion, the death, the resurrection. Theologically, we speak about the Paschal mystery. We're getting ready in Easter here to celebrate in a brand new way the Paschal mystery. But what's important about it and essential is that it's not just a memorial. We're not just getting together to have a meal to think about something that happened in the past. It's something that's happening right now. And in the Mass, it's a brand new reliving of that same historical moment of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. Many people, of course, refer to the Baltimore Catechism. Uh, but even deeper than that, than the Baltimore Catechism, theology teaches us that the Mass is the unbloody sacrifice of Christ. Same, exact same sacrifice. And if we knew what was going on, we would actually be at Calvary. There's some stuff with Padre Pio, if you want, I can share with you about how he celebrated Mass and how the veil actually was lifted, where people were able to see what actually was going on. Uh, through what do you mean by that, the veil? The veil of being able to enter into and see the passion of Jesus mm -hmm. being relived. Because when Padre Pio said the Mass, for example, as, that, as many other great saints who were priests, they actually suffered and agonized because the, a priest is always a victim. There's a part of priesthood that, as a priest, I'm a victim. I offer my life, my sacrifices, my struggles in union with that of Jesus for my brothers and sisters. In the Padre, that veil was lifted. Sometimes people would see him, literally, with a crown of thorns, bleeding down his face. One of the most uh, interesting in things that happened was a man who was very close to him and saw Padre Pio come out to celebrate Mass, going to the altar, carrying the chalice, and he was preceded by these luminous beings. They weren't present in the church. They walk in front of him, they're just filled of light, and this beautiful woman on his, whether his right or his left, and he wrote everything down, and he says, and he asked Padre Pio afterwards, a priest asked him, are those angels? Was that Our Lady? And Padre Pio, uh, when he read the letter, the, the priest showed him, he put his head down and he had it back, he didn't want to acknowledge it, because for him, there were secrets. And, but the priest pressed him, Padre, what should I tell him? And Padre Pio just nodded his head and said, yeah, there were angels and it was Our Lady. So the, 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 that type, that's what I mean by the veil being lifted. So the, the, the Mass itself, okay, I was telling you the story about Father Raymond. 
uh, in one of my conversations. I was very honored to be at an altar boy at his first Mass, Father mm. Maurice Raymond. And we were talking about the Mass, and, and he said to me, he says, Sammy, yeah. he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I would crawl on my yeah. hands and knees for miles just to go to attend the Mass. So when, when someone says that to you, it means that to me, there must be such a powerful thing in that Mass that we are missing. Exactly. What are we missing? I'm going to give you a little parable. Years ago, there was a, a guy who was a priest in the United His father came from Ireland in the mid-50s, came to the United States, lived in where it was, Jersey. And he went, I think it was 1956, he went to the World Series where Don Larson pitched a no-hitter. And he had no idea what baseball was. He was just sitting there. It was the most boringest thing in his life. And he couldn't believe, nothing was going on, no action. That as the innings were going on, everybody sat on their feet. And they're going nuts to people. And he's like, he just didn't get it. He had no idea. And of course, we know that in that famous game, that was the World Series, I believe it was the World Series, he pitched a no hitter. I mean, how often does that happen in the World Series? Mm -hmm. Because he didn't understand the deeper reality of what was actually going on. He was there, he was watching everything. Later on, subsequently, as he began to understand what baseball is all about, he realized what he was present at. And that's an analogy. That's fabulous. Of the deeper reality. Of the mass. Because we don't know what's going on. Because if we did, what you said to me before, it would be jam-packed. Yeah. Because the mass, living sacrifice, but which we participate, then we get to receive mm -hmm. our Lord in his real presence. Mm -hmm. You get to, if we knew that, that's worth it. Bill Gates giving, like, sometimes I say, imagine if like a priest stood at church and says, today I'm going to give out $100,000 to anybody who comes to man, it'd be jam-packed, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the Eucharist is a far greater infinite gift than that, mm -hmm. and you're, we neglect it, we don't know. Well, that's the thing that, you know, it's, it's interesting because when we have such a valuable thing for our lives there, okay, and, and how many graces yes. you get from the Mass. Father, um, folks, I'm talking to Father Pio Mandato, Father Pio Francesco Mandato, a uh, Franciscan priest in the Diocese of Scranton. We'll come back after this break. Welcome back to the Sam LaSanne Show. Folks, remember 24-7, you can watch all of our programs on ssptv.com. In the Hazelton area, we're on channel 13 and also HD 513, Pottsville channel 190, a Scranton, Wilkesbury, excuse me, Scranton 190 and Wilkesbury and uh, Kingston and Mountaintop channel 92. My guest is Father Pio Francesco Mandato. Uh, he was, um, he is a Franciscan priest and he received his first communion by Saint Padre Pio and his family knew Saint Padre Pio very well. Continuing on with the Mass, I said to you, uh, you said if, if we could only understand mm -hmm. and appreciate what the Mass is, We'd, our churches would be jammed, okay? Um, it's fascinating to me sometimes, and you know, it just, I'm not picking on anyone, but where people will stand in line for hours to go to a concert, and fine, but yet they'll pass the Catholic Church and find every reason why they can't go. And the, you know what really breaks my heart, Father, is uh, when we were growing up, my father and mother made sure I was in church and they were in church, okay? There was no excuses. Um, and a lot of us who grew up in a little town called Partiesville, I mean, St. Nazarius Church, we had to be there. I was an altar boy, and we were at Mass, and, and it, there was substance there. Unfortunately, today, there are some parents that really are doing, I think, I think, a total injustice mm. to the young people mm. by not taking them yeah. to Mass. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, that's, uh, it, it's, I think it has to do a lot with our culture. It's so secularized and pagan. And, um, and there's so many distractions. Well, one time they asked Pope Benedict uh, what one of the biggest problems in Western society was, and he says materialism. Because materialism uh, chokes the spirit. We experience that in our daily lives. We get so concerned and so connected with things, and uh, our Lord talks about it in one of his parables uh, back then, uh, and he's referring to the times of Noah. People are so concerned with buying and selling things. <coughs> buying and selling things they ignored the flood that was coming. So it's part of our fallen nature that we just get distracted. Um, and to enter into the Mass, the reality of the Mass, uh, you, you need a, a good intellectual formation. Going back to the analogy of this man who was watching the baseball game, if he had studied or someone had told him what was really going on, 
uh, he would have really appreciated it. And it's the same thing with, we need to be informed in our Catholic faith. That's the purpose of evangelization. Mm -hmm. So we do need a good, solid, intellectual, we don't need to be academics or scholars, uh, but we need to know our basic catechism of the reality. Uh, but there's another rub here that you allude, uh, kind of implied to why it's people stay away. And because Jesus is a tough lover. He's the most difficult lover we will ever meet, the most demanding of lovers. Uh, he's infinite love. And that's one of my points we're speaking about at the parish is that uh, if you begin to follow him as a disciple, uh, what must I do? The rich young man asks Jesus to enter eternal life. What does our Lord say? Keep the commandments. We don't like to hear that one. Um, because keeping the commandments always calls us to a, a greater love and in all sorts of life. You could be priest, married, single. I mean, he calls us and he challenges us to a higher law of love. So, Father, uh, before we show the relic of St. Padre, Padre Pio, Pio, what do you say to those fallen Catholics who feel that a golf game, a soccer game, a baseball mm, game, wow, a football yeah. game, uh, you know, going out, doing something on a Sunday morning or a Saturday need, who are not going to church and going to Mass. What do you say to those people? Well, I, I, as you were peaking, speaking, I, I thought of St. Matthew when our Lord, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, I think it's chapter 5 or 6, he says, he tells us, Seek the kingdom of God above all things, and then everything else will be given to you. So we need to put, put God first. And if you put Him first, then you go play golf. You can enjoy that. You can enjoy a good dance. You can yeah. enjoy yeah. having a good life. But if you neglect God, that other stuff falls apart. You know, it's interesting how in life, people who have neglected and, and because they're living fine, they have their two cars, they have a good job, and who needs God at this point? Why do, why do I have to go to Mass, especially take my children yes. to Mass? I don't need God. Yes. Except when you hit the bump yeah, in the right, road, right. Uh, when like Father Bishop Timmel, who's been on this show many times and a very good friend of mine, oh, wow. uh, he says when you hit a bump in the road, yeah, so it. when you get sick, Yes. And you, you, you think you're going to see the maker. All yeah. of a sudden, yeah. Yeah. you're right. back, you know, to church and you want God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, it's just fascinating to me. Now, um, so uh, not to lecture anybody, but maybe sometimes understand what you're really missing in life. And believe me, I said I'm a sinner. There's no question about that. You have a relic. Okay. Yes. Can I see that relic? Sure, okay. Yeah. This is, uh, this is the first time I'm seeing it, folks, okay? It's in the plastic bag here. Okay, this is the relic. Now, this is, um, this is a glove. It's one, yeah, one, one of, of the gloves that um, St. Padre Pio used to wear, okay? So, um, we had a relic here at St. Uh, Pauline Visentainer when Mr. Visentainer was here. In fact, this is the pin I wore with St. Uh, Pauline Visentainer. Um, what, what does a relic mean, and in, in, in wh what is it? Yeah, first of all, it's not magic, it's not yeah. superstition, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's not a sacrament, um, it's not holy in itself. But in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, there's a beautiful passage where um, when Peter and even with St. Paul, but I'm, the passage that comes with St. Peter, because he, he worked miracles in the name of Jesus, and sometimes people would, they couldn't get to him, and they would bring like a cloth or bring something that Peter touched, and they would bring this. Sometimes there's even a passage with water to some of the saints washed our hands and they bring these things to somebody else and it becomes an instrument of grace but it's got to be kept with faith a deep deep faith mm -hmm. so obviously Padre Pio had the wounds of Jesus uh, and uh, a relic was something that he touched especially in a particular way a glove that covered his stigmata uh, it's not holy in itself and but if it, it can evoke people's devotion and faith in the Lord then that's when our Lord can touch and um, uh, even work miracles. Uh -huh. So when you say, you know, you kiss the relic or, you know, for example, you know, the relic is no magic, etc. but what happens you know, with a person when, you know, when you're, you know, sometimes they say we have the relic of St. Peter. Yeah, I exactly. mean, when we were in Rome, when we went yes. downstairs, we saw the bones of St. Peter, okay. What, what does that do? Yeah, I think it evokes faith. <coughs> you know, like, uh, many times people, especially like non-Catholics, and there are even Catholics that have a hard time with stuff like this. First of all, we never worship this stuff. We never worship statues, you know, right. that whole thing. But um, it's, a, it's a human reality that mom dies, your wife dies, or we carry a picture of her. I may carry her rosary beads, mom's rosary beads, 
in my pocket. It's, it's not who she is, but it reminds me of her. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It could be a ring. It could be a cross. It could be uh, yeah. something else. You know, a flower pot that mom yeah. always loved. But it's a reminder of who she is, and it evokes a human sentiment. In your life so far, you know, uh, I, I could go back and tell you many miracles that happened. I mean, it, it, to me, they were miracles. What were some of the things that you have seen with people, you know, uh, individual people, whether yes. they were sick, etc., any miracles that happened, such as if a person who was sick and was cured, you know, miraculously? Have you seen any of those? Oh, yeah. I, up close, I, I'd have to give a little more thought. I'll share one with you with Padre Pio, which is really fascinating, because he was so immersed in the mystery of who Jesus, so he, Jesus is always a, the focal point, uh, that he became an instrument. I, I use him as an example of some of the saints, an overflowing fountain. But there was a little boy who was born deaf and dumb, and especially in those days, they couldn't do anything for him, and they took him to visit Padre Pio. Father was an atheist, wanted nothing to do with the Padre. They were afraid of him. Mm -hmm. And mom went into the church, little boy's running around, meets Padre in a confessional, face to face. Um, and Padre Pio actually calls him, and the boy could heard, heard the Padre speaking. He was deaf. He heard him. And he got very close to him. Padre Pio says, I want you to go outside and call your father. How do you know his father was even sitting out there? The little boy heard, went outside, and the very first words he ever spoke in his life were, Dad, Padre Pio wants to see you. And people think there's no Holy Spirit. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but, but, my, I, but I had to finish that thought with this. Which was the greater miracle? The boy was healed mm -hmm. of his deafness and his dumbness. The father was converted. Yes. Which is the greatest miracle? It's that internal conversion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that uh, a conversion from sin to grace is even greater than the resurrection. Mm -hmm. It's a, a participation. You hear so many times for people who have not gone to confession for a while, when finally they say, okay, fine, because they're either embarrassed or whatever. And, you know, if you haven't been for confession law, it's, it's difficult, you know, the, and then do I go to my pastor who yeah, knows right, me, right. I'm afraid of, so there's all these things, but uh, when we go to the um, Catholic Men Conference every year, yes, okay, yes. which is fantastic, um, and, and you have a, a confession, and you're face to face, um, you feel so great, yes, okay? Yes. I mean, yes, the feeling yes. you, you can't explain. Yes. Uh, it's it just so, such a wonderful thing. I tell kids a confession is taking a shower. Yeah. For your soul. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, elderly people out there, um, you know, sometimes, they're, it's, and you know the sad part, we have the Mass of Inspiration, I told you, Father. And, you know, these are people who cannot go to Mass. They would kill yes. to go to Mass. Yes. They would kill yes. to go into their, yeah. okay, okay. And yet, you know, you have these people who don't, could care less about what the Mass is going on, okay? And the interesting thing is how many people drop their kids off for catechism, yes. okay, yeah. and pick them up and don't even go to Mass, yeah. okay? Um, and I, here, I'm not lecturing, but, you know, it's such a sad thing. Until you hit that bump in the road, okay, and Father, pray for me. And, you, you know, 9-11, if you remember. Yeah, exactly. Churches were jammed. Um, One thing I, I like to tell people is that no matter where we are, and even striving to be faithful, and that we always regress, Always invite Jesus in your heart. I think that's always the key. And to me, our Lord, Jesus Christ, is the greatest answer to agnosticism and atheism, which is so prevalent today. Because mm -hmm. if you study his life, he answers that. He answers those questions. Is there a God? Study his life. The sad part about it is what we're with our kids face today via the internet, via television, and, and, and Hollywood is so anti-family, so, and, and yet we're, we're being sucked into that. Um, Father, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. You've been very busy and a very nice. Um, uh, Father, uh, his name is Father Pio Francesco Mandato. I highly recommend you, you, you Google him, folks. It's an interesting life he's had, and he is in the Diocese of Scranton uh, and does various retreats. He's currently doing a retreat. Can you show a picture of the sisters, yeah. too? I don't know. Oh, listen, that. I'm sorry. I, there's a picture here I want to, Andy put up. Uh, of uh, the sisters. I'm glad you remember that. I'm their chaplain. The, and, uh, Father Pio is the chaplain and the picture's up. Uh, this is the mother house in um, Tonkanic and I'm sorry I forgot That's that. That's okay. These sisters, will, I, mean, I went to a parochial school I, and I used to, I don't want to get wrapped. In my well, head. they don't do that. They don't, oh, do, they that. don't do that. Okay. But tell me about this picture very quick. That's what Bishop, Bishop uh, Bambera comes once a year to visit and uh -huh. we were all there. That was Christmas. Uh -huh. And the sisters are uh, semi-contemplatives. Uh, they have three houses in here in the diocese. They're a new community, and they're, as you see from the picture, they're young, 
joyful and just love the Lord. Well, Father, uh, I, I'm sure you know you, you don't have television. You live the life of a hermit to, yes. to a degree. And uh, um, thank you very much, and thank you for bringing the relatives. Sure, folks, and blessings, remember, everybody. Blessings. Uh, and uh, folks, uh, it's 24-7. You can watch this show anytime. Uh, for those of you who are not going to church, maybe no matter Protestant, Jewish, or whatever, Amen. think about it. Think about it, folks. Amen. We'll see you next time.